Hi, I'm Russ of Aquarium X Pets, and in today's video, I'm going to tell you how I changed the substrate that I use for my isopods. Isopods can adapt to a wide variety of substrates, but some are clearly better than others. For example, years ago, I used to use cocoa fiber as a base substrate for my isopods. Now, I don't use it for my isopods anymore, but guess what? I raised thousands and thousands of healthy isopods on it. It's not dangerous for the isopods when used correctly, it's just not very nutritious, so the isopods have to rely on other sources of nutrients if it's used as a base substrate. And they're adaptable like that. Another thing that I used to do that I don't do anymore is add soaked wood pellets to my substrate. Was it a problem to add them? Well, no. I raised many generations of isopods that way too, with great success. But I don't do it anymore because the nutrients in the wood pellets are not really accessible to the isopods until the wood begins to break down, and that can take a long time, even in ideal conditions. This is not to say that wood pellets are useless to the isopods. However, they do need to undergo the proper processes first so that the isopods can make use of them. So now, I'll describe some of those processes. Wood pellets can be used as an ingredient in kinshi, which is a medium for the growth of fungal mycelium that produce mushrooms. Mycelium is the main fungal body consisting of a network of hyphae, or root-like structures. The mycelium travels into the wood, breaking down substances called lignans in the wood. Lignans provide structural support in the wood, and as the lignans decrease, the isopods are better able to get at the nutrients in the wood, and the fungal mycelium itself is nutritious to isopods. The kinshi I have used came from bugsincyberspace.com, and I'll put a link down in the description. A similar process occurs to create white rot wood, which is a name given to various fungal species that can colonize the wood, or given to the wood after those fungal species have colonized it. You can obtain wood pellets that have been colonized with white rot wood from roachcrossing.com. I'll put a link down in the description to that as well. I've used that with success. In the isopod hobby, perhaps the most popular way to make wood pellets nutritious to isopods is to make flake soil. I really don't know why the name flake soil caught on, because it's not soil, nor is it particularly flaky. It's the result when a combination of wood pellets, often oak wood pellets, and other ingredients such as water, yeast, and wheat bran under appropriate conditions cause the wood pellets to ferment. This greatly increases the nutritional content and digestibility of the wood. You can look up how to make your own flake soil. There are lots of recipes out there online, or you can buy it. I'll put some links down in the description to sources of flake soil as well. I've experimented with making it myself and had some success, but it's a long process and it involves some pretty intense olfactory experiences. I've come to the conclusion that I'd rather buy it when I need it. Underlying all of what I've said so far is this. Isopods can really thrive when they have access to microbiologically active base substrate and leaf litter. It makes perfect sense. That's what they have access to in the wild 24-7. Kinshi, flake soil, white rot wood, all help accomplish that. They've all been modified by fungi and or bacteria to make them more nutritious and attractive to isopods. In other words, the ideal isopod substrate has a healthy community of microorganisms in it. It's microbiologically active. Next, we'll talk more about leaf litter and how to make the nutrients in leaf litter more accessible to isopods. But first, I want to thank my patrons. Something that I like to say about this hobby is that if I'm not always learning new things, I'm doing it wrong. And my patrons help give me the opportunity to keep learning and to share what I learn with you. If you're interested in becoming a patron, please check out the link at the end of this video or in the description. So, back to leaf litter. Dry and especially heat treated leaf litter is not optimal for isopods. On the other hand, Decomposing leaf litter is full of bacteria and fungi, and the isopods benefit greatly from feasting upon those bacteria and fungi. However, here's the problem. If you just collect leaf litter or rotted wood outside and dump it straight into your isopod enclosure, there is some risk of adding pests or predators or competitors, or all three, to your isopod enclosures. Yet, if you heat sanitize the substrate, you're killing off beneficial bacteria and fungi. So what should you do? Well, you have various options. Some people are simply willing to absorb the risk of possible pests being added to an isopod enclosure. And they collect rotting wood and decomposing leaf litter. They 
just take a close look at the collected materials and remove anything that looks suspicious. And then add it to their ice pod bins. Some people have absolutely amazing success with this method. As the substrate is microbiologically active the moment it's added. And I've talked to other people who have ended up with a colony of stone centipedes that ate all of their isopods. So try this method at your own risk, but there is a lot to be said for it. Another option, of course, is to obtain and use one or more of the microbiologically active materials I already mentioned, like flake soil, kinshi, white rot wood, and add them to your enclosure. That way, there is a lot of nutritious matter in the enclosure from the start, even if the leaf litter hasn't had a chance to decompose over time. And it will, eventually, if conditions are right. This method involves a little investment in quality materials, but it can be a good way to start with a very low risk of introducing pests along with your substrate. An additional possibility, which I first heard described by Kyle Candillion of Roach Crossing, is to collect some leaf litter and then put it into a container outdoors that holds water. Cover those leaves with water, and over time, the leaves in the water will start to decompose and will get slimy and rather smelly. And that's a good sign that they are microbiologically active. And since they have been immersed in water over a period of time, they are a lot less likely to be a source of terrestrial pests. I do suggest you take steps to help small people or animals from entering your leaf soup and make sure that you don't start an accidental mosquito culture. But you can make some very high quality food for your isopods. A tip I learned from Kevin Nasser at Boogie Down Bugs was to use the method above, but to add a little molasses to that water. The idea is that sugars and other nutrients in the molasses can help to accelerate the decomposition process of the leaves. Kevin Nasser and Josh of Isobuddies talk a lot about substrates in this video here. Definitely worth checking out. Something I have been doing for a long time, and which seems to help a lot with microbiological activity in my isopod enclosures, is adding springtails to a complete isopod enclosure for a couple of months in advance of adding isopods. The springtails, as well as just that time, can help the microbial activity in the leaves and substrate get off to a good start. You can either do this in the bin where the ice pods will live, or in a separate larger bin full of lots of base substrate, leaf litter, and springtails, which you can use to fill smaller bins as needed. Lately, I've been testing another method, and I've had good results with it. I add a superworm along with the springtails to a new ice pod enclosure. The lone superworm will eventually pupate and mature into a beetle, but since it's by itself, you don't have to worry about it breeding and overtaking the enclosure with little superworms both as a larva and as an adult. As it eats and produces frass, it will help colonize the enclosure with beneficial bacteria. I generally remove the superworm or the superworm beetle at about the time I add the isopods, just in case the beetle decides to make a meal of a molting isopod or maybe of tiny juveniles. I'm not sure how much risk there is there, but I try to err on the side of caution. The beetle can live a couple of years and you can move that beetle onto another enclosure to start the process again. The idea of using insects and other hexapods, like springtails, to benefit an isopod enclosure is certainly not new. Kyle Candillion of Roach Crossing has found that many isopods do exceptionally well in communal setups with his roaches, where the isopods can feed upon the roach frass, which is full of beneficial bacteria, as well as shed skins, uneaten food, and so on. We discussed this and other successful communal invertebrate enclosures a while back in a live stream that you can check out up here. These days in my enclosures, I use various substrate solutions, incorporating the methods I outline above. In the simplest enclosures, I use organic compost as a base, often with some ground eggshell for calcium and to help buffer pH with leaf litter on top. I add a sphagnum moss hydration station and some hides. Depending on the need of the individual species, I usually employ one or more of the methods I have just described to make the culture microbiologically active, and it's a recipe for success. Most isopods do really well. In these setups. One of the great things about this hobby is that there is room for more than one way to do things. Perhaps even more important than that is the fact that there's always room for improvement in the care that we can provide to our isopods. If you learned something from this video or you want to share something you've learned about isopod substrate, let me know down in the comments. And thanks for watching. I post videos every Friday with live streams on Wednesdays all on aquarium and vivarium pets with lots of isopod content. Please rate, share, comment, and if you haven't already, subscribe. And then 
tap the bell for all notifications so you don't miss my next video.